Well, thank you very much, uh, Will, uh, for that very kind introduction. It came straight from my website, and I wrote it myself. Um, I understand at the end of the last presentation, there was uh, a PowerPoint up on the screen about the Attorney General's cufflinks. And just in case anybody is worried, my cufflinks come from China. Actually, no, you really should be worried. No, they were imported from China. Hopefully Huawei or no other equivalent company has tapped into them and everything is fine. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak this afternoon, particularly around the issues of the right to be forgotten. Uh, as I was introduced, yes, I believe in freedom, but I also don't believe in shying away from controversy or saying things which may offend or insult people, uh, and so I'm going to take a pretty hard line on what I think about the right to be forgotten and human rights in my speech today, and I look forward very much to your questions. But before I do so, I just want to give some broad overview about the Australian Human Rights Commission because there seems to be a lot of confusion out there and to be quite frank, up until the point that I was appointed Human Rights Commissioner, I wasn't 100% sure how it operated either. There are currently seven commissioners at the Australian Human Rights Commission, including the Age, Race, Sex, Disability Discrimination Commissioners, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, the Children's Commissioner, and the president of the commission, Professor Gillian Triggs, who manages all international human rights issues, including asylum seekers. Um, so for all of you who keep tweeting to me, why am I not standing up on asylum seekers? The answer is because that's somebody else's job. But I contribute to discussions around that, but that is not my full-time job, otherwise I'd be putting somebody else out of one. And despite popular misunderstanding, it is not the role of individual commissioners, meaning people like me, to investigate individual complaints from the public. So stop sending those to me as well. Just, <laughs> the role of human rights commissioners is actually to deal with systemic issues around policy that exist in terms of human rights or respective areas. Complaints are actually dealt with by our complaint service, which sits under the president. So you should feel free to send them to the president or to info complaints at humanrights.gov.au. The role of the Human Rights Commissioner in particular is to look at the challenges being faced in terms of systemic areas of human rights challenges uh, in policy, uh, which range of course from as broad to as narrow as you wish, but I have made it clear that I want to focus on traditional human rights and freedoms such as freedom of speech, association, worship and property rights. Privacy of course also partly fits into that discussion, though I should also acknowledge there's a separate Commissioner for Privacy. His name's Tim Pilgrim. But we do stay in touch from time to time and have lovely chats. Now the idea behind human rights is actually centuries old, but preserving human rights is essential for our, human right, for our society today. Human rights have evolved following hundreds of years of events and thinking from Europe and the United States that have framed our liberal democratic traditions. It was the signing 799 years ago, pick it up, 800 years next year, of the Magna Carta or the Great Charter of 1215 by King John that led to constraints on the power of the monarchy. Liberal Enlightenment thinking then universalised human rights for all people in the 17th century through great philosophers such as John Stuart Mill and John Locke. These influences led to the social, economic and legal framework that many of us living in liberal democracies largely enjoy today, but of course we also take it far too often for granted. It provided the foundations of the United States' Declaration of Independence that asserted that all people are created equal and have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sentiments, of course, echoed in the American Constitution and Bill of Rights. Similar sentiments were echoed in France's Declaration of the Rights of Man of the Citizen, which proclaimed that all citizens are to be guaranteed the rights of liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Now, while Enlightenment thinking concluded everybody, everyone had foundational human rights, it was the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights that took these principles from Western liberal democracies and globalised them. But up until the Universal Declaration, they were fundamentally built on liberal ideals. The ideals are the rights of the individual to be able to own their own bodies, own their own lives, and be free to seek and pursue their opportunities and their enterprise. It was about the individual. It was not about broader social concerns around issues of cohesion or uh, issues of justice or anything else. 
The Universal Declaration was built on Franklin Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union Address that prescribed a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first two of Roosevelt's essential human freedoms were freedom of speech and worship. They come directly from the liberal tradition about the rights of the individual. The third was freedom from want, meaning securing, and I quote, every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants. The fourth was freedom from fear, meaning, quote, that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbour. Now, these latter two ri uh, rights, well, latter two freedoms, I should say, reflect the events of the day. Freedom from want reflects the politics of the Great Depression. Freedom from fear reflects the politics of the Second World War. More importantly, these last two freedoms are a departure from the traditional liberal approach to human rights based in individuality. These two freedoms formally establish the idea that freedoms can exist without corresponding rights, that rights cease to be about individual autonomy, and that new rights could simply be imagined or gifted from governments. These ideas were then littered through the Universal Declaration and the subsequent international human rights treaties that exist, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, etc., And the UN system that has continued to add new human rights to the list has resulted in the dilution overall of the integrity of human rights. We often call it rights inflation. Behind human rights, of course, is still the revolution, if you look at them from a liberal perspective, the revolutionary idea that every human being is free and equal, that individuals own their own bodies and lives, and they are free to pursue their opportunities and their enterprise. But if you take the latter day definition, human rights are basically whatever the government decides at any time we have. Human rights provide the foundation for our liberal democracy, our market economy, and our civil society, and we must fight to preserve and protect them in that tradition, the liberal tradition. Preserving and protecting human rights is essential to ensure that individuals are not merely treated as a cog in the machines of government, society, or the economy. At the heart of human rights is the dignity of the individual itself. And of course, we can't afford to take them for granted. So where does this leave the right to be forgotten? I would say it's symptomatic of human rights today, where they have been, uh, been made essentially irrelevant and devalued from their sacrosanct liberal principles to be treated as such a catchphrase to be attached to any cause in need of inflation. That is what a right to be forgotten is about. People have concerns around issues of online privacy, they have concerns they've put up information or somebody else has put up information about them at some point in history, and now they're using the language of rights to justify why there should be some limitation on what can be put up online about them or can be searched about them. And therein lies the problem with the so-called right to be forgotten. It is just a fiction. There is simply no such thing. Now, of course, what is the right to be forgotten? I'm probably speaking, preaching the here because you're all very well versed in the subject matter. But if you take the European Union's explanatory memorandum on it, in 2010, a Spanish citizen lodged a complaint against a Spanish newspaper with the National Data Protection Agency and against Google Spain and Google Inc. The citizen complained that an auction notice of his repossessed home on Google search results infringed on his privacy rights because the proceedings concerning him had been fully resolved for a number of years and hence the reference to him and the purchase was entirely irrelevant. He requested first that the newspaper be required either to remove or alter its pages in question so that the personal data relating to him no longer be appeared. And second, that Google Spain or Google Inc be required to remove the personal data relating to him so that it no longer appeared in the search results. Individuals have the right under certain conditions to ask search engines to remove links with personal information about them under this newly forged right to be forgotten. This applies where the information is inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant, or excessive for the purposes of data processing. I'd like to make a very simple proposition about the right to be forgotten. It doesn't meet any standard or test of a human right ever developed in society. Of course, it doesn't meet the liberal test, which is it isn't about the individual exercising 
their liberties. So it is completely unnecessary. It certainly doesn't meet the basic test of privacy, which is if people have information that is secret to themselves, that they can provide it to other people in conditions of secrecy or privacy, but after that you are uh, infringing somebody's rights if you make something public. But once something is public, you cannot unwind it. Of course, it does nothing to stop other people exercising their rights either. It also doesn't meet any real test of what a civil right is. Even if you take the attitude that civil rights can and should be gifted by society at different points in time, that is not what has happened in the case of the right to be forgotten. Courts are not society. They have simply invented something that has no intellectual basis whatsoever beyond a broad public policy concern. Now, of course, courts have ruled on important civil and human rights issues before, and that isn't in dispute, but they have always appealed to an existing right, particularly things like equality before the law. And that's, of course, what we see at the moment in terms of how courts approach issues around civil rights and access to marriage for same-sex couples in, say, for instance, the United States. They don't just do it by saying, well, we've decided to create this new right around marriage for same-sex couples, they attach it to an existing human right around equality before the law and the government should not discriminate without an unjustifiable reason. And if anybody wants to see a very good documentary on this point, they should go and watch The Case Against Eight, which is a documentary that recently came out in the United States, which goes through the full legal arguments about why uh, uh, marriage should be extended to same-sex couples on the first hand, but the legal arguments that underpinned it at the same time. So it simply doesn't meet the standard of what is normally necessary for a civil right. It hasn't been decided by a parliament, it hasn't particularly been advocated for from the community or society, uh, and it certainly doesn't exist in any other type of international treaty or any other standard. It's just simply a fiction. And actually it has a very dangerous component to it. It's actually anti a civil rights agenda. A civil rights agenda ordinarily involves people being treated equally under the law. Yet the right to be forgotten does not do that. It actually creates the reverse. By actually going through a process of creating a class of people more entitled to a certain degree of privacy than other people. Normally we say people have equal rights, but the right to be forgotten says that if you are rich, if you are powerful, if you're in a position of political influence, you have less rights to privacy than the man on the street or woman on the street. That is, of course, a doctored interpretation towards rights. It actually undermines the principle of equality before the law. So what are the arguments in favour? Well, some people argue that a right to be forgotten is essentially efficient because of jurisdictional differences between establishing a common standard related to privacy and what can be accessed online. But that's simply an absurdity. Firstly, we don't junk rights simply because of efficiency gains. That's, a very nature, that's an anathema to the very nature of rights. Equally, of course, we see lots of different jurisdictional issues around the internet. This is nothing new. Does it mean it's, things are efficient or easy? No, but that is the nature of the world in which we live in. And it's certainly not a standard that can be imposed universally under that principle. Of course, the other argument that's put forward is that it somehow helps with technological innovation. But that presumes that there is sort of one form of technology which uh, information is put on which through technological innovation should somehow be restricted when there is some sort of innovation in the future. I simply don't accept that argument. If something has been put out there in the public domain, you can't just say that simply because there's some form of new innovation that it should somehow be less easy to access. The same argument could simply be made about the internet in its entirety in, versus, uh, in comparison to information that was put in newspapers or books in the pre-internet era. Technological innovation is not an argument for it either. The only argument I have any sympathy with is with relation to children. Of course, children, the argument in favour of children and protecting their right to be forgotten, as it were, is that they may put up information during their childhood that they do not want to be searchable later on in life. But of course, that abrogates the general responsibility of parents in all aspects of a child rearing uh, environment. This has been a well-established challenge in lots of other areas, but it does not justify limiting other people's rights or creating some sort of new confected right to seek to achieve it. Essentially, it's a modern day comparison of kids wanting to be protected from photos of themselves sitting in a bath being shown to their friends. 
except of course this applies to the workplace and everything else. It also massively undermines, of course, the enormous amount of effort and energy that's going into a marketplace to develop uh, the sorts of tools and technology necessary to deal with some of these challenges. No doubt some of you may be involved with that. But I don't also have any sympathy, despite having some sympathy around the issue with children, for young adults. The idea that kids somewhere between the age of 18 and, well, they're not really kids then, but 18 and in their early 20s who do stupid things then post them online should somehow have some sort of right to have them removed so that they doesn't inform or affect their future employment prospects. Because this is part of uh, the capacity for people to uh, scrutinise candidates in all aspects of society. Whether people should be doing it or not is a different proposition. But people cannot be separated from their past conduct just because they find it desirable. In fact, that's very anathema to the whole idea of rights and responsibilities. We also, of course, ignore in the process the importance of developing social norms to deal with the challenges around people uh, uh, excessively using their uh, freedoms and embarrassing themselves. Uh, it's, uh, I always point out to people that when mobile phones first came out, which some of you, in fact, lots of you will have been around there at that point, but at least in the 90s, it used to be cool to answer a mobile phone and have it ringing in an environment such as this. There was no recognition of social norms because it was a new technology and nobody knew how to use it properly with respect to others, or they didn't, and they thought they wanted to stand out. But over time, we've of course developed social norms which respect and identify that people shouldn't do that, or at least that they should have things on silent, or they should be looking at their phone like they are right now instead of listening to me, or perhaps they're tweeting about it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course similar standards are also being developed around social networking and people figuring out what they should put up online or what they should not be putting up online. These of course evolve spontaneously through society, through learning and through growing. The idea that we should circumvent this by trying to suppress information that already exists in the public domain is absurd. Of course there are also arguments against the one, against, including the ones that I've already mentioned. There is, of course, the argument that's an attack on free speech. And it does, to a certain extent, restrict free speech. It restricts what people can see and find on the internet, which is already publicly available. But there's an important distinction between the right to be forgotten and what, for instance, Google already does in terms of deleting information that can be accessible through their search engine. The difference is that it's state-sanctioned. When Google decides they don't want something accessed on their, uh, on their search engine, or Yahoo or any other company, but I keep mentioning Google because I think they're a sponsor, they are. There you go, free advertising. Uh, they, they do so because that's their choice and as a consumer you choose to participate in their search engine knowing full well or at least being able to access that certain information is not available. It's a very different proposition when the state comes in and says you can no longer access this information or that Google of course is directed by the state to say that they have to remove information, or access to information uh, if people no longer wish to find it. It's also important to point out that this isn't about privacy. All the information that people are seeking to suppress through the access of a search engine is already in the public domain. It's only about whether it's searchable. And that, of course, as I've already pointed out, creates a very basis for corroding of the reasoned exercise of rights. Rights come with responsibilities. And part of people exercising their rights with a degree of reason and proportion is that they can be held in the good standing of others. Scottish political philosopher and economist Adam Smith wrote in The Theory of Moral Nations, uh, Moral Sentiments, that uh, people exercise and reason their behaviour based on wanting to be held in the good standing of others. And so when you remove a pillar or a platform where people can be able to do that, you necessarily undermine the very basis uh, for which people exercise their rights proportionately. There's also another fundamental problem with deciding what is relevant and what is irrelevant when we're talking about the removal of information in public. As Baroness Prasher, in the who's the chairman of the House of Lords EU Home Affairs Subcommittee, try saying that five times or fast, argued, who decides what is irrelevant? Voters have a right to know more about the background of those standing for public office. A past offence which, for most people, might no longer be relevant, may be highly relevant in the case of a doctor or a teacher. The court's answer was that a link should not be removed where there are particular reasons such as the, play, the role played by the data subject in public life. 
But that actually assumes that the request can be ascertained that it is relevant. And let's look at the very basis in which this court ruling was made. A real estate purchase was made by an individual and they no long wish to, longer wish to have that information made publicly available. But what happens if some point later in their life they decided to seek public office? They may have significant conflicts of interest if that information is not able to be ascertained. There could be, of course, if you look at the, uh, the challenge around the House of Commons and uh, the scandal around uh, use of various pensions and entitlements arrangements, it's a very direct and explicit reason why people will know, want to know exactly what type of assets people may have. Of course, the other fundamental problem is it privatises judgments on information such as free speech to private companies such as search engines. We don't normally privatise that sort of information. It's left to the courts to make decisions and to decide what information people can access or not. Well, certainly, if not them, then a government agency, as much as I have scepticism around leaving the government to do these things as well. To continue a quote from Baroness Prasher, who I mentioned before, it also, uh, he also argued that a company size of Google can cope with the volume of requests it receives, but it cannot be right to leave it to search engines to evaluate requests against such impossibly vague criteria. But that's precisely what a right to be forgotten does. It privatises that choice about searchable information with the enforcement of the state to private companies and in the end has a deleterious impact in terms of human rights more generally. Thank you very much and I'm open to your questions.